Good evening, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for having me here today. My name is Dolita Cathcart. I'm an associate professor uh, here at Wheaton College in the History Department. The title of my talk tonight is Collateral Damage, the Effects of Racism on White America. But before we start, I have a question. How many of you here today have heard of the term intersectionality? Good, good number of you. Uh, how many of you, you know what it means? Yeah, kind of, most of you. <laughs> okay, good. Well, intersectionality is a term coined by American civil rights advocate Kimberly Williams Crenshaw to describe overlapping or intersecting social identities and related systems of oppression, domination, and discrimination. The idea is not a new one. Black feminist scholar Bell Hooks, recognizing the racism of the nation's various women's rights movements, wrote, quote, Every women's movement in America from its earliest origin to the present day has been built on a racist foundation, a fact which in no way invalidates feminism as a political ideology. The racial apartheid social structure that characterized 19th and 20th century American life was mirrored in the women's rights movement. The first white women's rights advocates were never seeking social equality for all women. They were seeking social equality for white women. The marginalization of black women in the women's movement by their white sisters resulted in the development of black feminist theory, which is what intersectionality was called back in the later 20th century. Essentially, one cannot look singularly at skin color, prejudice, gender, or class issues. In the United States, skin color prejudice, gender, and class are intertwined. They intersect with one another. Black feminists of the later 20th century recognized one cannot speak of gender for example, without also speaking about skin color and class. These issues have to be examined together to be fully understood because we are all interconnected, whether you live in a gated community or never interact with a person different from yourself. What happens to one has an effect on all others, a sort of social chaos theory of interconnectedness. Now today we will examine this intersection of skin color, class, and gender and discuss how these issues have contributed to the opioid crisis in white America. I will begin with a quick summary of relevant African American history, move to the war on drugs and mass incarceration, and then end with how these issues together has resulted in the opioid crisis. The first Africans sold into slavery in the British colonies happened in Virginia in 1619. Slavery in those early days resembled indentured servitude enslaved Africans were not necessarily enslaved for life. They were referred to as servants. They intermarried with white indentured servants and Native Americans. And all three frequently rebelled against slave-owning whites in the South. The result of these rebellions was a stiffening of what were called black codes, laws whose primary purpose was the control of African descent persons, free and enslaved. The ending of white indentured servitude and the killing and or removal of Native Americans. By the mid-1700s, slavery as we know it today was in place. For example, whites uh, changed the tradition of having a child follow the father's condition because it meant that when a white man raped a black woman, their child would be free. That did not make good financial sense and also would result in a free mixed heritage population whose rights should be that of whites at the time, regardless of their skin color. So they changed the rules, and the child was to follow now the mother's condition. This made it possible for slave-owning whites to naturally increase their enslaved population through rape, because their brown children would now be slaves for life. During slavery, the local police and deputized uh, civilians arrested and kidnapped African Americans throughout the nation both those who escaped their bondage as well as those who were free, and re-enslaved them both in the South. The use of police forces to control black and brown people begins during slavery and continues to this day. The police do not make the laws or policies. 
They just carry out the preferences of the wealthy and the powerful, those who do make the laws. The enslavement of Africans and African Americans was a boon to those wealthy enough to own people and a psychological boost to those too poor to buy a person. The growing economic inequities among different economic classes of whites required giving something to poor whites, and that something was the idea of whiteness. Servant, serf, or peasant, none of that mattered in the new nation because these Americans might be poor. Their white skin color, though, elevated them above those of a darker hue. In other words, at least in the United States, poor whites would not be at the bottom of the political, social, and economic ladder. This psychological boost was important because poor whites did not get much more. Prior to slavery being abolished in the northern states, only those whites who owned property could vote. That meant no women of any color could vote, and only a small percentage of white males could vote. The control of our democracy was in the hands of slave owners in the North and South, as well as other wealthy Northerners. The laws that were passed, our very Constitution, was written to advantage this small percentage of white males. The abolition of slavery in the North, though, caused great consternation among poor whites in the North who are now in no better a position than an emancipated black male. In order to keep the majority of white America in line, the franchise was open to poor white males as well. This helped to maintain a distance between poor whites and poor free people of color, two groups that should have otherwise been natural allies, as in those early, earlier days of slavery and indentured servitude. By the early to mid-1800s, some middle-class white women began to agitate for the end of slavery. Now, free blacks in the North and the South had been agitating for the end of slavery for at least a century by then. The interesting thing, though, about these white women activists is that they fought to end, when, as they were fighting to end slavery, they realized that they were enslaved themselves. They were not free like their brothers, and they were essentially owned by their fathers or husbands. The moment of realization created the first intersection between race or skin color and gender. As a result, white women abolitionists joined with black abolitionists and together struggled to abolish slavery and win their own civil rights. Though these folks were able to see the intersection of race and gender, they were not very good at seeing the role of class in that equation. So poor people remained marginalized. The end of the Civil War, unfortunately, tore apart the coalition of white and black abolitionists. Prior to the ratification of the 15th Amendment that granted black men the franchise, fought to be included. Unfortunately, most white men and women did not. But they had little to say, little power at the time. In fact, most white women during this period did not believe women were capable of exercising the franchise in a thoughtful manner. Early feminists realized they needed more white women fighting for their rights, particularly the white women of the South. But in order to appeal to their Southern sisters, they had to cut their ties and support of black women and black civil rights. The short-lived understanding of partial intersectionality in regards to skin color and gender was over. White women and black women did work in parallel to fight for women's rights, but they were no longer part of a united front. Three amendments were ratified after the Civil War, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, except in prisons. The 13th Amendment passed by Congress on January 31, 1865, and ratified December 6, 1986, states, quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. This remains the law of the land. In prison, the individual does not have control of their body, and they can be forced to work for little uh, more than food and housing. 
We will come back to this amendment in a moment. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution was adopted July 9th, 1868 as one of the Reconstruction Era Amendments. The amendment addresses citizenship rights and equal protection of the laws and was proposed in response to issues related to the formerly enslaved following the Civil War. The 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870 and contained two sections. Section 1 stated, the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2 granted the US Congress the power of enforcement through legislation. But the only citizens were male. Women didn't really become citizens until around 1920, with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Prior to that, women could lose their citizenship if their husband were not a citizen and deported for some reason, like for being a Chinese national. She would be deported as well. Her condition followed that of her husband. OK, so back to the 13th Amendment. Prior to the ratification of the 13th Amendment, the reconstruction of the South was left to Southerners. And the Southerners in control were the former slaveholders who were looking for a way to regain their property. So for the first two years after slavery, the South re-initiated re, uh, a type of slavery. They called it uh, an apprenticeship, but where the apprentice would be an apprentice for life. To make matters worse, the 13th Amendment also gave these former slave owners a way to regain their property through the prison system. As a result, black codes were passed that essentially made it illegal to be black. Now, what do I mean by this? That newly freed African Americans who did not have jobs or homes, and in some cases even clothing, because their former slave owners claimed the clothing belonged to them, could be arrested and forced into the convict lease system, which still exists in parts of the South today. Prisoners were leased to landowners, factory owners, and mine owners, for example, and forced to work under horrendous conditions, often worse than slavery. At least during the slave era, most owners did not want to totally incapacitate their human property or kill them. But these prisoners did not even have that protection. They could be killed with impunity, or starved and beaten, or just disappeared. The prison industrial complex became the new plantation. And though it focused on African Americans, particularly African American males, poor whites were also caught up into this system. The major difference was that a black person did not need to actually commit a crime. If more workers were needed, more blacks would be arrested, convicted of vagrancy, and serve a long sentence as a convict in the convict lease system. Now, throughout the rest of the 19th century, the former slaveholders and their sons controlled the South politically, socially, and economically. They also controlled national politics in Washington as well. They continued to pass black codes, but, uh, which were later called, of course, Jim Crow, in order to exert control over black Americans. But many of these laws also affected poor whites as well. But those poor whites still had white skin privilege, even if that privilege did not add much money to their pockets. Jim Crow legislation controlled the public lives of black Americans in every possible way. I'm sure you're all aware of the separate water fountains or blacks required to sit at the back of buses or in Negro railroad cars. But so much more was controlled. Blacks and whites could not play checkers together or be buried in the same cemeteries. Blacks could not try on clothing in stores, go to public parks or pools, eat in restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At every moment of the day, they were treated like second-class citizens. And that was only on the good days. African Americans fought this discrimination from the beginning with little success. The NAACP's legal team in the early 20th century did have some success. But if the laws were not being enforced, then their legal successes meant little. Larger changes did come in the 1950s. In 1954, the NAACP won the Brown v. Board of Education 
uh, Topeka, Kansas case that found that the separate but equal segregation policies in schools were unconstitutional. But little change occurred. But after the brutal lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till in Mississippi in August of 1955, things began to heat up. Even though the murderers confessed their crime, they were acquitted by an all-white jury. And just recently, really just a couple of months ago, the widow of one of the murderers confessed that she had lied to the police. In any case, a few months later, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white man and was arrested. That arrest sparked the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted about a year and was successful, desegregated the bus line. Two years later, Little Rock happened. All of this activity helped to galvanize activists and students, which led to the sit-in movements of the 1960s. Change, though, was slow and incremental. More dramatic, perhaps, in the South, but it made little to no difference in the lives of black Americans everywhere else in the nation. So the cities erupted, white support began to wane, the draft for the Vietnam War uh, threatened uh, the lives of middle-class white males, causing even less support of the civil rights movement. And of course, King was assassinated. LBJ then drops out of the presidential race because of the war and Nixon promising law and order and using what is called the Southern Strategy appealed to the frightened and racist alike and won the presidency in 1968. The Southern Strategy opened a new market, if you will, of voters to the Republican Party. Working class white males and females, also known as lunch pail Republicans. The white men had to now compete with all women and men of color for jobs because of programs created to mitigate sexism and racism, namely affirmative action. Their identity was further threatened as more women began to join the women's liberation movement and as more people of color were able to attend college and enter the job market. What good is masculinity and white skin if it no longer afforded an advantage or control over women's bodies and people of color? Republicans realized the Southern strategy worked and they continued to use it uh, to link racists and misogynists to the party to this day. Their Big Tent approach included the Christian right, anti-choice activists, heterosexists, and more. Essentially, the Republican Party has become the party of the rich and the party of marginalized whites in the nation, white nationalists, the Klan and their friends, poor whites holding on to the promise of whiteness and male privilege, religious extremists, gun rights advocates, and more. These are not necessarily bad people, but they are often people whose focus on their singular issues and fears blinds them to everything else that is happening, including to their own self-interest. While Nixon's Southern strategy gathered disaffected whites to the Republican Party, he also created an enemies list. This list included anti-war protesters and civil rights activists, basically hippies and blacks. In an interview with Dan Baum for Harper's Magazine in 1994, John Ehrlichman, who had been Nixon's White House counsel and then chief domestic uh, advisor, but he's more famously known for creating the Watergate plumbers with H.R. Haldeman. Ehrlichman stated, quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or, or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. But the mass incarceration of African Americans really began under Ronald Reagan. In 1980, 0.2% of the population was incarcerated. By 2008, it was 0.8% of the population in prison. Reagan, who also used the Southern strategy, essentially characterized 
drug users and people in public assistance as black. So poverty and drugs became a black problem, even though there were considerably more whites on public assistance and the majority of drug users were white. According to the conservative FBI, 75% of all drug users are white. But the police focus on poor communities and communities of color, those with the least amount of power. Also, some drugs are seen as white drugs and others as black drugs. Powder cocaine, for example, is a white drug, the drug of choice of Wall Street. And crack cocaine is a black drug, a drug for the poor. The result of these skin color coded drugs was a sentencing disparity between the possession of crack cocaine and the trafficking of powder cocaine, a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity. A person caught possessing five grams of crack cocaine received the exact same prison sentence of someone caught trafficking 500 grams of powder cocaine and the same prison sentence of someone convicted of a violent crime. <clears throat> Drug offenses also had collateral consequences that other offenses did not carry. For example, once convicted of a drug offense, the ex-offender is denied public benefits, public housing, licenses, and more, making it nearly impossible for the ex-offender to go straight after prison. No job, no home, no car, and if drug addiction was a problem, no help either. We could spend weeks just discussing this issue, but the bottom line is that there were about 500,000 people in prison in 1980, and by 2008, there were 2.3 million people in prison. This dramatic increase in the number of prisoners also meant more prisons were needed to be built. The right turned to the private sector privatized prisons and made it a multi-billion dollar industry. As you can imagine, this flow of public dollars to private prisons is a boon to prison industrialists. And you can also imagine who they support politically, those who want to keep those prisons open and full. Now every generation is faced with wars to contend with or to clean up after, and with racism, sexism, classism, anti-Semitism, and heterosexism. The roller coaster struggles to do away with all forms of hate had its better times and its worst. We are now in the worst of times, a conservative backlash of historic proportions, a white nationalist revolution that denies science, facts, and reality, an error that essentially purports that all women and all people of color are worth less than straight, able-bodied Christian white men. These beliefs have existed for a very long time. Our democracy is a continual work in progress. And we have struggled with these social constructs of power and myths of superiority even before we were a democracy. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that social progress in the United States is always followed by a backlash by those who believe that equality diminishes them in some fundamental way. After all, you can't be superior if everyone is equal. So after the Civil Rights Movement, the nation voted for law and order and the war on drugs. Both were direct attacks on black America, a way to continue to, con to control a group of people who dared to be free and equal Americans. Now certainly there are many who delight in the chaos. We are witnessing the dismantling of the American state and its ideals and the struggle to save it. It's, uh, it's quite a mess, and we are just past the first year of a conservative dream come true that is our collective national nightmare. But difficult as it may be, we all need to understand the vote for our comrade president, a backlash to the two-term presidency of Barack Obama. Understanding does not mean we cease to struggle to protect our democracy, but that we more fully understand how and why we are at this point in our national development and what exactly many of us are resisting. The continuing downward economic trajectory of blue-collar white America in the post-industrial era has made it clear that working-class white Americans are no longer receiving a wage 
real or psychological for their whiteness, as first promised through the US Constitution. This broken promise of white male supremacy, once supported by slavery and the second class citizenship of white women, coupled with continuing racism, sexism, the Great Recession, the loss of jobs and homes, the lack of good paying jobs for whites without college degrees, and the near destruction of unions since the Reagan era has had dire results. Too many whites are once again turning to white nationalism in the hope that a racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, and heteronormative ideology will rescue their white skin male privilege in a post-industrial world and return them to their delusion of supremacy. Now, nationalism is a middling stage for ethnic or skin color identity development. To some extent, it can be considered a type of consciousness raging, raising stage for those who feel aggrieved for one reason or the other. But there is a problem with white nationalism in comparison to other ethnic or skin color identity models. White nationalism is based on not recognizing what we all share. Instead, it rests on the myth of white skin color superiority and the demonization of the other, African Americans, non-Christians, all women, and other people of color. For these other groups that do not self-identify as superior to all others, the identity development stage that follows nationalism is the recognition that others share many of the same challenges and obstacles to full equality. Instead of demonizing the other, these groups seek to form diverse coalitions in this next stage. But this is not the case with white nationalism. The next stage for white nationalists is fascism and their attempt to make permanent their position of social, political, and economic superiority over those with a different skin color, gender, or religious tradition. White nationalists may have won the recent election, but white skin privilege will not trump automation or reverse the loss of better paying blue collar jobs to technology and robots. As long as white nationalists continue to rest their hopes of redemption on white skin privilege, they will remain stuck in an ideology that can no longer privilege them over others in this post-industrial era that is bedeviling all Western nations. When they do finally wake up to the reality of their situation and recognize that their true allies are the very people their grandfathers lynched in the past, the rest of America must be prepared to welcome them back into the fold. We have to work together to resist fascism and protect our democracy, as imperfect as it may be. Many of these desperate people can be redeemed, and we need all of the allies we can muster to protect the nation, all of her citizens, and the environment we all share. Now, the Reverend Martin Niemüller was born in Lippstadt, Germany in 1892. Niemüller, who became a leader of a group of German clergymen opposed to Hitler, was arrested in 1937 and sent to Sachsenhausen and Dachau. He was later rescued by the Allies in 1945. In describing the dangers of apathy, Niemüller wrote, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. In addition to speaking out against apathy, Niemüller was also noting something Western societies generally have difficulty understanding, that we are all interconnected and not just entangled in a subatomic particle kind of way. Physicists might call this a form of social quantum entanglement, but in any case, we are not truly independent of one another. What we do to one will have unintended consequences to others. There is a term for this, blowback, a word coined by the CIA to describe the unintended consequences of America's actions abroad. Racism's direct victims may be people of color, but racism also hurts racists and non-racists alike, and not just as a moral failing. For example, 
In various studies conducted uh, since the 1990s, researchers have shown that many white medical uh, students, residents, and doctors believe blacks have a higher threshold for pain than whites, among many other false and bizarre beliefs. As a result, doctors prescribe fewer painkillers to black patients than whites suffering from the same illnesses. In one study out of Emory University in 2000, 74% of white patients received pain medications, but only 50% of blacks. In 2015, another paper noted that black children with appendicitis were three times less likely to receive pain medication than white children with appendicitis. Other studies have shown that black cancer patients were also three times uh, more likely to be under-medicated for their pain than white cancer patients. So it's easy to see how skin color bias affects people of color, specifically black Americans, but what is this blowback onto white America? The opioid crisis. While pain medications were kept for many black patients, whites were being overprescribed, And when they, many could no longer gain access to prescribed opiates, they turned to cheaper and deadlier drugs, mainly heroin and fentanyl. Drug addiction in the U.S. has long been made to seem a black problem by conservatives looking to politically exploit a southern racist strategy that linked poverty, violence, and drug addiction to black Americans. The blowback to this strategy was that poor whites suffering from these same issues were ignored and left to suffer and die. Segregation robs us of empathy for those we judge to be other less than and inferior. And that lack of empathy for the other blows right back onto all of us. As long as poverty and drug addiction was assumed to be a black thing, poor struggling whites would only be ignored. But poor whites themselves also rejected what little help was available for drug addicts at that time because it meant that poor whites would have to admit that it was poverty, not skin color, that was the real culprit. And if that was the case, then white superiority was nothing more than a myth, a wish, a delusion. But the opioid crisis today has dispo, dispo, uh, dispo, uh, sorry, <laughs> disproportionately hit white middle class America in addition to poor white rural America, harder than any other skin color group. The response to this middle class crisis is very different from the crack cocaine drug crisis of the 1980s that resulted in a lock em up mentality and the mass incarceration of black Americans, specifically black males. Also ignored was the methamphetamine crisis of poor white America. The whiter and more middle class opioid crisis, though, is treated differently. Whites now overwhelmingly see drug addiction as a disease, not a moral failing. Police chiefs are calling for drug courts and treatment beds. Doctors are even suggesting that special drug shooting galleries be opened in medical centers so that drug users could inject heroin more safely and be closer to help if the addict overdoses. Since 2015, over 64,000 and counting drug users have died of opioid overdoses. Another 2 million are hooked on prescription opiates. And it's only getting worse. That is one way that racism has hurt white America. So how do we fix this mess? Well, just about everything would need to be addressed and changed, and that only causes more people to balk, especially if the changes would seem to mean that a privileged group would lose those privileges. So the following are just a couple of ideas. <clears throat> Too many, but certainly not all, of our brothers suffer from the insecurity of changing gender norms and workplace displacement and turn to a form of hyper or toxic masculinity in search of relief. Unfortunately, this hyper or toxic masculinity only feeds the so-called alt-right, the racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, and heterosexist American nationalist movement that resulted in the current political mayhem we are all witnessing. Combined with the opioid crisis, our post-industrial economy, and a lack of education, the suicide rates among whites, particularly white men, has skyrocketed. Middle age, poor, rural, white males without a college degree in our western and southern regions 
are killing themselves in numbers never seen before. All men, but specifically poor white men, need a liberation movement that frees them from a psychological dependence on the myths of masculinity and male superiority intended to soothe their insecure egos. If not, many will continue to be drawn to movements that perpetuate the very conditions that feeds their fears and hatreds and that results in the continuation of sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, heterosexism, and their own deaths. Certainly those who are secure in themselves do not need some magical notion of superiority to thrive, but for those who believe they are better than so many others and have nothing to show for it, the cognitive dissonance is deadly. They are literally killing themselves. They need our help as well. My final thought regarding what we might do to begin to address these issues was stimulated from rereading Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. I was reminded that many black men and women found guilty of felony drug charges, usually over marijuana, can't vote until they pay court fees. They can't pay the fees because they can't get jobs. Those who do manage to score a job are frequently only paid minimum wage and thus still cannot afford to pay court fees, let alone their rent. In other words, millions of people across the country can't afford to pay court fees and that keeps them from exercising their franchise rights in far too many states. In Florida alone, 2.1 million people are not allowed to vote because they owe court fees. These fees tied to voting rights are a new poll tax that disp disp disproportionately prevents black males from voting. But these policies also include white males and all women caught up in the war against drugs and are also too poor to pay these fees. So we need a campaign or a movement to raise money and to use the money to pay court fees that keep millions of nonviolent ex-convicts who were overwhelmingly arrested for the possession of marijuana from being able to vote. So adopt a state. Start with Florida. Search what is going on regarding this issue in that state, and if you can, contribute to end this travesty. There are thousands of things we can do to resist the further entrenchment of American fascism. But most importantly, we must stay optimistic and resilient. Like our sisters and brothers before us who struggled against slavery, Jim Crow, sexism, anti-Semitism, heterosexism, all racisms, classism, war, nuclear weapons, and more, we must believe in this struggle, believe in its very righteousness to free us all. You are all already well armed to take up this struggle or to continue to struggle for full equality. You know how to find facts. You already know how to research what you don't know. But lead with respect. You are not going to win anyone over to your truths through insults and name calling. Reach across the aisle. Understand that the long joked about robot apocalypse is very real for blue collar workers in a post industrial world. Their pain is real and spreading to other job categories and will affect more workers throughout the United States and Europe with every passing year and with each new technology. No one is truly addressing their very real pain beyond a rhetoric of division. Don't feed that division. Be better, be smarter, and let us all try to think and act our way out of this box through thoughtful and unrelenting action. You know what works and what does not. The reins of social constructs that so bedeviled those before us have been loosened, freeing us all to think like people not genders or skin colors or religious traditions. Run with this, build on this, and keep your hearts open with love and hope. But know that love and hope and prayers are not enough to make lasting progressive change. We need action and participatory democracy or risk losing this country of promise. End the identity politics of old and form a great new coalition of multiple beloved communities working together to protect our democratic values.
for the years to come. Thank you. Okay, so I think this is the, uh, the point in which if there are questions online or uh, in the audience, I'm more than happy to uh, try to address those questions. Or not. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> whisper, whisper. Hello, Professor. Hi there. <laughs> it's good to see um, you. So, something that I was wondering in terms of just um, the way that you encourage. Um, reaching across division lines and the um, language specifically in your lecture, could this be misconstrued almost as kind of an elevation of whiteness mm -hmm. in helping white people understand their full potential? Could that be misconstrued in a negative light? Certainly, <laughs> right? Uh, certainly anything I, I think is possible. Um, you know, might someone take this information and decide that this is the new rallying call for the Klan or you know, the, their friends or so, uh, and create the, some strange new civil rights, uh, you know, movement uh, out of that. Um, but I think certainly what I'm hoping uh, that comes out of th this work is that all of us have to understand that everything we do has a ripple effect, right? It may affect just our friends or our families. Um, Something as simple as plagiarizing a, a paper, you know, in college means, oh, now the professor has to get in action and, and get the, the board together, and there's now going to be a, you know, a trial, if you, if you will, ripple effects. And nobody is happy doing, you know, those sorts, uh, those sorts of things. If we can begin to understand how interconnected, you know, we are, then maybe we can begin to release right, these ideas that have been uh, essentially forced upon us right, for, for generations uh, now regarding what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be mm, Hispanic or, or black or poor or wealthy? Right? All of these stereotypes that we have in our head that affect how we act on a day-to-day -day basis and how we treat one another as well really easy, particularly for the marginalized, to kind of demonize white America as the reason why everything is <laughs> you know, not going so, uh, so well. Um, but if we don't understand that there are real and lasting effects that also reverberate or, or blow back onto white America, that is killing them. Mortality rate has been increasing in the United States. The age in which uh, you know, most men die has now decreased for the first time. Uh, and, and why? Because of the number of suicides of, of you know, poor, white, non-college educated uh, uh, men in, in, in basically in our red states. Uh, their states are not taking care of them. Right? The politicians are only trying to keep the division uh, going. We, the rest of us, have to really be, I think, prepared to resist maybe the, um, a negative way of addressing maybe these kinds of issues. Uh, and try, maybe not the older generation, but at least among you know, younger folks, try to, to really live up to what Martin Luther King had called for uh, throughout his uh, activist life, and that's the creation of, of beloved communities, where we really just see each other as people and not as categories of people to be feared or, or hated. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we don't have any questions, but Virginia Beard, who is watching, Oh, I'm sorry. 
Go right ahead. <laughs> we have a question in the audience. Okay. Um, yeah, I, w I was interested in your thoughts on uh, how history is taught in America and how some history has been separated out into African American history and is not taught, and and, and how the role, how that has played a role, and and how it should be brought back together because I see a lot of misinformation when people talk about losing our history by taking down Confederate statues or even which generals have statues and which generals don't have statues. Is, uh, so I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts. Sure. Well, I think history is, um, particularly you know, K through 12, is horribly taught in this country. I mean, just about everybody who comes to college comes to college hoping that they never have to take a history course ever because it was such a horrible experience. Uh, in, in, in high school. Uh, most students, though, once they take a history course in college are, wow, this is history? Uh, you know, it's far more interesting than what uh, they had encountered uh, earlier uh, in, in their life. Now, most of the way history has been taught in the, in the United States, at least American history, has been taught in the, in the United States for m most of our history. Uh, was really excluding marginal, you know, those who are on the margins. There was no women's history being taught, certainly no history about African Americans or Native Americans or uh, people of, uh, of uh, Latin backgrounds. Uh, it was the history of presidents and kings and, and generals. Who won the war? Who, who created the, the country without really taking into account all the folks who, who would built the, the, the country. Should it be taught, like I teach a lot of African American uh, history courses here, should it be taught differently, all integrated uh, together? Uh, I kind of try to do that when, when I teach, so it's, it's, it's not just looking through things uh, in, through one lens. So uh, I try to talk about all Americans, white Americans, black Americans, Native Americans, uh, women, poor people, rich people, try to, you know, weave it in. Part of the problem, though, is that if we were really trying to teach an integrated history, we'd probably have to do it in 10-year intervals, <laughs> you know, because there's so much going on. You take any period of time, and, you know, you look left, you look right, all, all the way around that there is rich history going on. What do you include? What, what don't you include? So I hear what you're saying, and I think you're quite right, that as long as we continue to have our history separate from one another, it's very difficult for uh, young people, for, for members of this country, to really see it as, as integrated, right? As requiring um, sort of the connection, right, of, of, of all of us. Uh, but I think what tends to happen is that you have to figure out, well, I'm teaching an American history course from time X to time, you know, Y. Uh, is it going to be looking at it from through a women's lens? Is it going to be looking at it through uh, a, uh, a black lens? What lens are we, you know, using to, to, to look at that? And that, I think, has to do more with um, pragmatics at, at this point. It's the only way to try to cover that much history in a short period of time so that you end up splitting it. I think most historians who are worth their salt try to, you know, ensure that uh, the context is as rich as possible, even if you're looking at uh, just a sliver of, of that history. Um, I have a question from Makia Moody, uh, class of 2000, who's also on my board of trustees. Makia? asks if you could elaborate on the point that the Republican Party is that of white nationalists. I gather that there are Democrats who are white nationalists also, but perhaps I misunderstood your point. No, you're absolutely, and, and hi, Makia, it's nice to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> glad you're watching. Uh, you're quite right. There are na uh, white nationalists who are Republicans, Democrats, communists, <laughs> probably, uh, independents. Um, it, it doesn't really maybe matter overall which political party uh, folks are from. But it's, it's been the Republican Party uh, you know, in this country that has appealed directly to these folks, um, really since the Dixiecrats split 
from the Democratic Party. Those were those uh, Democrats in the South who were not exactly um, in line with how the Democratic Party was moving uh, in the North, uh, for example. Uh, so those folks ended up leaving the Democratic uh, Party and becoming Republican. Uh, from that point on, uh, particularly uh, in the South, appealing to uh, kind of racists, uh, members of the Klan, uh, who would later become basically white nationalists, that was how they got their votes, trying to kind of maintain uh, those uh, individuals under their uh, big tent. Uh, they were not going to join the Democratic Party at that point, uh, not, not the one that sort of developed out of the 1940s and 50s. Um, they pretty much were uh, connected to and continue to be connected to uh, the Republican Party. Now, uh, certainly there were many Democrats, for example, who voted uh, for Nixon uh, in uh, 1968 and again in 1972. Uh, these conservative uh, Democrats, uh, some who would later change their party and others who may have maintained their party uh, affiliation. So McKee is quite right. We don't want to assume that the, the only naughty people you know, in our country are, are Republicans. They come in every you know, possible uh, political uh, ideology. Um, but as far as the two-party system uh, is concerned, the appeal of uh, racism and sexism and, and homophobia uh, and classism, uh, that appeal is really being sent out by the Republican Party these days. Okay. I, I have another question from Carrie Hicks, parent 2019. She asked, do you think public education or lack thereof has had an impact on this as well? If so, how? More specifically, underfunding black schools ensures that white people will be more qualified for colleges or jobs. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's a real easy one. Uh, yes. Um, I think there's a major lawsuit uh, to be had, a class action lawsuit, in just about every city, township in, the, in this country, uh, suing their states, their municipalities, for the failure to adequately fund and educate um, Americans, really of all uh, skin colors. Uh, it certainly has a major impact uh, in uh, larger cities where uh, most of the public school kids tend to be kids uh, of color. But it's in Ohio, it's in Nebraska, uh, it's in coal mining you know, towns. Uh, wherever there's poverty, uh, there's a poverty in, in, in education. Uh, there are many, uh, particularly in the red states, many teachers who are, are barely college graduates themselves, who have not been trained uh, to be teachers, who are not certified uh, to teach uh, uh, their young people. Uh, and this is going to have an incredible effect on uh, children, regardless of their skin color. Um, so yes, uh, money does help propel uh, one group uh, towards college, and not only towards college, but able to pay you know, for college as well and, and not be saddled with uh, a major debt. Um, but this is really a, um, a problem of all poor people. And uh, there are, in sheer numbers, more poor white people in this country than there are poor people uh, of color. So uh, yes, our yeah, I can't say caller. <laughs> yes, our internetter uh, is, is correct, but I, I would add the, the larger class dimension uh, to this. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, sort of returning back to what you mentioned about needing a white liberation movement, so thinking about those kinds of mass movements as starting on kind of a grassroots level, how would you suggest that, say, an ally like myself or um, others could start to approach talking about this, you know, in college classrooms, in coffee shops, or anything like that? How do you think we could kind of start sort of where the grassroots thing needs to happen? You got it. 
So, so this is a really hard one, right? Because how do you start, particularly a, 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 a male liberation movement, right? Um, that doesn't turn into the promise keepers or, you know, Robert Bly poetry slam, you know, with folks, men dressed as uh, Native Americans and holding talking sticks, you know, and the like. How do you really create a movement that is like the feminist movement, one that is meant to free men and women from these gendered constructs right, that, that we all have been uh, damaged uh, with. It has to happen from the guys. Right? It, it, it's not going to happen from, uh, from women. Uh, <laughs> it really isn't going to happen uh, from women. We already know <laughs> the guys need you know, this kind of movement. It really has to, the grassroots aspect has to really develop among men. They have to see the toxic nature of what this um, idea of masculinity as it has been created in this country um, has done to them. And you know, as long as it looks like, well, I'm more likely to get a job, and if I get a job, I'm more likely to get you know, more uh, money than, than a woman or a person of color, this looks pretty good to me. I mean, it's not fair or anything like that, but uh, you know, it's, who's, who's going to throw away a privilege in, in that respect? Right? It, it, it sounds crazy. What they have to see are all the negative effects of that kind of mindset. Um, and that's sometimes a little bit more difficult to, you know, to uncover. Uh, it's going to be different depending on where you are in the country, what economic class you, know, you, you belong to. Are you married? Are you single with children, without children, college, no college? All of those are going to affect to some degree um, you know, what kind of problems or issues you might face. The other problem is that you're really battling the, the gendered construct itself. Right? What we're telling guys to do is get together in a group, talk about your feelings, you know, <laughs> really try to express what's, what's happening and, and what have you. Eh, it's not going it, to, it, it can't look the same as it did for women when women were doing this kind of work going to have to be different because they're guys. You know? and it's going to be a few generations before that stuff uh, you know, gets, gets wrung out. So I don't, I don't have a precise prescription of what such a movement, I wish I did, <laughs> what such a movement um, looked like, looks like. But I do think it's a movement that our young men, right, our younger generations, are going to be able to, to handle. They already uh, have more empathy than uh, their fathers and their grandfathers. They're already more sensitive than their fathers and their grandfathers. They are more willing to talk about their feelings, maybe not as much as women, but more than their fathers and their grandfathers. Uh, young, young fathers today are doing more in the, in, in the home than certainly their fathers and grandfathers. Uh, men are, some men are willing to be stay-at-home dads and raise the kids because the wives are making more money or because they're just suited. This is what they want to do. So we see these changes, the incremental maybe, are already happening. What these folks now need to do is all talk to one another. Right? If you just have folks kind of planted all over the place and they're not really talking with one another and, and not really trying to um, uh, understand the negative aspect of their gender uh, construct, right, beyond the I have power, I have money, you know, so what, what am I complaining about? Um, the folks who have the power and the money is really a very small percentage, you know, of folks uh, relative to the, you know, the entire uh, population. Uh, how do we get now the folks who may have not had very much education, also don't have much money, don't have many employment prospects because of lack of factories and, and that we're in a post-industrial era to talk about this stuff, that's going to be more difficult. But feminists, you know, essentially found the same thing. It began as a middle class, upper middle class movement. And it took a while for it to begin to move down the economic, you know, ladder uh, and begin to interest women who were not um, as wealthy, as well off, or as, as educated as those uh, who began the movement. So I suspect it's going to happen, if it happens, similarly. That it's going to be more middle class, college student, college educated uh, folks 
uh, talking about these things, uh, voting along those lines um, as well, uh, running for office and, and, and trying to uh, change policy as opposed to maintain the status quo. Um, that's where that grassroots action has to, has to happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, say that, I mean, say that again. isn't it a question of bravery as well? Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the white nationalist movement is about, you know, I've got to protect this, uh, they're taking away that. Um, and, you know, when you look back in history, there's examples of, of, of white men that were very brave, that were fighting against the grain, whether the gentleman who wrote um, Black Like Me, um, uh, Colonel Lewis Merrill, um, Bonhoeffer in Germany. Um, so uh, to me, it's a conversation of bravery. Are you going to be brave enough to stand and say we're all Americans, and you know, we we can work through this as opposed to I'm protecting what right. I've got, and they're taking this from me. Right. They're going to take my guns. They're going to take right. this. And right. I think that it's kind of. I, I'm curious on your thoughts. On I, I I agree with you. It 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 does um, it does take bravery, uh, but I I think what we it's easier for those with more education, I think, to kind of see how this all plays out. For those who are the product of, of poor schools, underfunded schools, um, teachers uh, without uh, maybe much training, uh, who've only ever expected to work at the same factory dad and or mom worked you know, in and like to write their uh, ATVs and shoot off guns and you know things along that line. I mean, th this is what a lot of people do in in rural America, and it's fun for them. <laughs> Drive around on those little wheel things, you know, whatever they're they're called, and um, shooting small furry th you know animals. Um, this this is how folks get pleasure. And to infer that, well, that's not such a good idea. You really should be a more sensitive guy, and maybe you shouldn't beat your girlfriend up too much. And what they've been resisting that kind of talk for a very, very long time. So I hear you. I agree with you. I, we have to start somewhere. And I think the likely place for, for it to begin is among the middle class and, and the more educated. Um, not alone. They're, they're, plenty of folks who uh, aren't wealthy and, and may not have a college education who uh, would be interested in this. But I, I think the conversation sort of begins there. And then men talking to, you know, to other men uh, begin to figure out how they can reach out to their um, poorer brothers uh, and their less educated brothers and try to you know, offer them a hand into seeing the world in a slightly different way. You know, I think w women can, can certainly be supportive. Um, we can certainly make uh, um, uh, suggestions. Uh, the whole history of the feminist movement, women's movement, um, would be uh, a good place to start for, for men interested in this. But ultimately, this is going to have to be men talking uh, to men, men who understand what it means to be a man. It's not easy to be a man in this uh, country. With all the power that men may have, uh, it's a rather stressful uh, position. You have to be strong. You have to, right? You have to, uh, you know, behave in a certain way, look a certain way. I mean, it's not just uh, women who are um, struggling with what it means to be a woman in this society, how thin, how tall, how blonde, how brunette, or, or so. Men are suffering from the same issues. You know, do they have a six pack? Do they, are their guns really, you know, uh, AR-15s or just little pop guns? You know, I mean, how, <laughs> that was my joke. <laughs> you know, how, uh, how they look is beginning to affect men in our society over the last uh, 10 to, to 15 uh, years. And, um, you know, like anything, it, it can't be, uh, Im imposed upon them from somebody else. It has to happen within, uh, within the group. 
within men themselves. Um, bravery is good, but when people are scared, it's very hard, as we know, right, to be brave. Most people run away. Very few run towards the danger, or run, run towards the fear to, to address it or to try to help others. Most run away. How do we get the folks who are running away? It's easy to get the folks who are running to the issue, but how do we reach out to those who, who, who just can't conceive of anything different than what they've been doing all their lives and what their dads and, and granddads have been doing? This question comes from <coughs> Temple Goodhue, class of 1969. She mentions, in Massachusetts, where do you see the most egregious? Egregious? Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Denial of equity, and which groups do you feel are most effective in implementing real change, groups or institutions? Okay. Well, the folks who have the short end of the stick uh, in, in Massachusetts are poor people, number one, right? Regardless of skin color, it's poor people. Disp uh, disproportionately, it tends to be people of color. But, you know, I, I, I live in Boston, so I have a very east, you know, east Massachusetts, eastern Massachusetts way of looking at things. It's all of Western Mass uh, that is not doing uh, very well, and that is predominantly, uh, you know, predominantly white. So a lot really depends on where, where your focus is. So, do away with the skin color idea for the moment and just say the poor people in the Commonwealth um, are not getting what they need uh, to progress. The poorer you are, the more likely you're going to be facing uh, traumatic events in your life. We don't have the uh, mental health capacity uh, to, to kind of deal with children who are in trauma. This affects how well or poorly they do in school, which affects whether they're going to be staying in school, whether they even have the chance to ever go to college. In all likelihood for many of these kids, it ends up being a uh, sentence to a, uh, a prison uh, or a jail. It's easy to feel for the child, but when that kid turns to be 17 or 18 years old, their history of trauma and poverty and, and, and fear and, and the, the dislocation from communities and the like, where we no longer care about those. That's the point in which we begin throwing uh, folks away in earnest. But because we tend not to pay any attention to the real needs of the poor, because it costs money. If we're really going to do something, you know, we need to have the money uh, to do it. And uh, you know, we have now spent about 20, 25 years of just wanting to have tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts after tax cuts. And you know, even this last tax cut, I did pretty well in this last you know, tax, tax cut. Uh, so my little bank account is going to be a little happy month after month, but I keep thinking about who's being hurt because I now have a few extra bucks in my pocket. What are we not getting for our larger society now that I have a few more? dollars that I didn't have before, so I didn't miss it, you know. Um, I guess, you know, s some wag would tell me, well, you can always donate it. Well, I, I do that, <laughs> I do that too, but it's not enough, right? It's not enough to really make a systemic change in our society unless we are willing to, to pay for it. And the only way, you know, we will pay for it is if we care enough. And for a lot of people, it's like, oh, I don't have kids. I don't care how the schools are. They don't affect uh, me. I don't want to pay for better schools. You know, I don't want to uh, uh, vote for some sort of override uh, in the taxes. It's short-sighted. Kids are our future. The kids aren't doing well. We're not going to do well in our old age <laughs> because they're going to be taking care of us or not taking care of us. Right? They're going to be supporting us in some fashion with their taxes unless there aren't any more taxes to pay. It's awfully short-sighted. One more question. Uh, this is hi. This is Sophia Darby, class of 2017. How do you combat bitterness and distrust between different groups within the activist community? How do you maintain your optimism? Mm. This is difficult. 
Um, I, I was a student activist when I was in, in, in college. I, I think I probably spent more time out of the classroom and more time so in, in the street, which is why I have such a strict attendance protocol <laughs> in my <laughs> classes. Um, so I, I went to college in the, the, the 70s, and uh, so we were still dealing with many of the same issues that uh, those uh, a bit older, I'm, I'm the end of the baby boom generation, so those, you know, the earlier baby boom uh, generation had to deal with, but uh, had some benefits from the work that they did. So we had lots of protests going on on campus all the time, and we didn't always agree with one another um, or so, but we were finding that uh, you know, one group would get maybe 10 people would come out and, and protest, and another group, maybe they got 15, maybe they got uh, five, and no one's paying attention to such a small group of, of protesters. Uh, so we all got together and agreed to support one another. We had a protest, I'm going to your protest. When I, when I have a protest, you come uh, to my protest. And it made a, a major difference. On, on the college campus and in, in, in many ways. We got a um, women's center um, out of it. We had the first gay and lesbian awareness day, the history you know, of, the, uh, of the college. We uncovered the shenanigans around the housing lottery that was supposed to be random, only to find out it wasn't so random um, at all and involved a great deal of both classism and racism on campus on where uh, students were being uh, you know, placed. Um, we're not going to agree on, on every score. But if we are all essentially fighting for the same goal, human rights, right? however imperfectly it may be, right? some folks are just going to know more around this stuff. Um, some folks are going to be more doctrinaire than pragmatic. Right? All of that is true. But we're not going to get any place unless we're willing to reach across the aisle. I mean, right now there's a, you know, a lot of struggle uh, between, I think, you know, some of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, folks and um, more right-wing uh, uh, women, but who think of themselves as feminists, except around uh, the abortion uh, issue and the Me Too movement that started with a black woman but now seems to be overwhelmingly you know, white, right? All of these things, and we can just get totally um, wrapped up into why this isn't, this isn't as perfect as I'd like it to be. But if we're not showing up for each other, uh, one thing is certain, no one else is going to show up either. So we only have one another. It's, we have to think of it uh, like a family, you know? Your brother might be a pain in the neck, but he's your brother, <laughs> you know? So you go, you love him, you deal with him, even though he might be a pain in the neck, because you know he thinks you're a pain in the neck um, as well. Uh, we have to think of ourselves as a family, and that maybe together, um, slowly, sometimes in smaller groups, it doesn't always work with larger groups, you begin to talk more about who you are, what your history uh, is, and that bridges an understanding that our segregated um, society uh, prevents on, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We're much more segregated today than we were back in the 1950s. And as long as we remain separate in those ways, we don't know each other's stories. And when we don't know each other's stories, we do what every human being does. You, you, you go back to the stereotypes uh, that you were taught um, as a kid because you don't have any other information. And the only way we can break those stereotypes is by embracing one another. And I know it sounds kind of hokey and <laughs> all of that uh, kind of stuff, but it, it truly is the only way. And that means forgiving one another when we step in it, when we make mistakes, when we, when we use the wrong terms, when we, we seem to be a little maybe retrograde in our thinking, that if we jump down the throats of every single person who makes a boo-boo, there's nobody left for us. So we have to be understanding. You know, we, 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 have, to, we have to look at the long, the long picture here, right? The, the, not, not just what's in front of us, but how long such, such a movement has been going on and how long it'll probably continue to go. I know within my own lifetime, 
I it was not, it was a lot worse when I was a kid <laughs> around you know issues certainly of race you know class and uh, and gender things are better in many respects uh, today as well as they are uh, the same um, and I think it's only if we are willing to embrace one another and understand one another and forgive one another that we're going to manage to get any place. My little violin, I think. <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I have at this time. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for, um, for listening to me. And um, I'll see you around campus. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight.